Greetings from the Iranian Studies Unit of the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies, and welcome to our conference on institutions and politics in Iran. Over the next three days, beginning today, we will examine the establishment of the Islamic Republic and the institutions of uh, Iran since its inception, but also since the constitutional amendments of 1989. What we have in Iran are a series of institutions that are both elected and unelected, and transposed on these institutions are a complex network of formal, informal, and semi-formal institutions and networks that together create a very complex political system, a political system that is now more than 40 years old and seems to be quite robust and in power despite its own efforts, despite itself, and also despite uh, efforts from the outside, such as the maximum pressure campaign that was the hallmark of the Trump administration's Iran policy. Our three-day conference, which features a selection of renowned scholars of Iran, will examine the institutional makeup of the Islamic Republic and the power structures that characterize the Iranian political system. Placing the birth and evolution of the Islamic Republic within a broader context of Iranian history, what we hope to do over the next three days is to examine specifically the changes and the transformations that have occurred, not just in the Iranian political system, but within the context of contemporary Iran in relation to, uh, and, and the changes that the state specifically uh, has uh, undergone. And specific focus, of course, will be on some of the key institutions of the state, such as the presidency, the parliament, the judiciary, and the revolutionary guards. We begin today with three of the most renowned scholars of Iran, Shirin Hunter, Aran Keshavarzian, and Ali Reza Eshrawi. Shirin Hunter will kick us off with looking at the Islamic Republic of Iran in historical and institutional perspective, ruptures and continuities. Professor Hunter is a, a honorary fellow at Georgetown University's Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. And for a number of years, she was also a research professor at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. Then we have Aran Keshavarzian, who is Associate Professor of Middle Eastern and Islamic Studies at New York University. And last, but by no means least, we have Ali Reza Eshraghi, who is a visiting scholar at the University of North Carolina's Center for Middle East and Islamic Studies. We're all in, a, in for a huge treat. These are three of the scholars uh, whom I have read for a number of years and I have followed and I have actually cited uh, them quite extensively and uh, we're quite thrilled and pleased uh, to have the opportunity to listen to their insights and expertise today. So without further ado, Shirin, I'll turn the uh, floor over to you uh, and uh, you have 15 minutes. Uh, I should add incidentally, that after the presentations, after all three presentations, we have about uh, 40, 45 minutes uh, for uh, questions and answers. So uh, go ahead, please, Professor Hunter. Thank you very much, uh, Mehran, and uh, greetings uh, to my fellow panelists, uh, and of course, those who are taking part one way or another uh, in this uh, gathering. Um, I have very little time and uh, I would like to uh, stick to my limited time, so I will start. Um, um, in my paper, which deals with the changes that uh, the Islamic Revolution has wrought in Iran, um, 
I um, advance a thesis, which I happen to believe is, is correct, of course we all do, that uh, Islamic Republic actually marks a really significant break uh, from uh, Iran's uh, uh, political and uh, even cultural and, and social uh, uh, history. Um, and uh, I will say why. Uh, before doing that, I'd like just to very briefly uh, say a few words on what was the situation in Iran, what was Iran's political system, what was the uh, dominant, um, uh, shall we say, discourse uh, in Iran at the time, and how Islamic revolution changed all this. Um, the Iranian system politically at the time, uh, at least uh, on paper, was a constitutional monarchy. Um, but obviously, uh, we know that uh, uh, the, the reality was far more uh, different. Uh, the parliament and elections and so on in Iran, as they are now, uh, were not uh, as free as they should be. And that uh, certainly by the time that uh, uh, revolutionary forces gathered momentum, um, it was really the monarch that uh, uh, made all the important uh, the decisions. Um, Having said that, uh, I think that when we come to the question of people's rights and so on, uh, I think that there was a lot more uh, uh, freedom, I think, um, except, of course, political freedom. And in fact, this is something that even the Islamists and revolutionaries are admitting to. I remember Mr. Taj Zadeh said that um, during the monarchy, we had all, all our freedoms except uh, political freedom. Of course, political freedom is a very important part of the uh, um, civil liberties and so on. So I think there was, but on the other um, respect, in terms of, you know, lifestyle and, uh, uh, you know, people's privacy and so on, I think that the, the government's hand was not uh, very, uh, uh, um, uh, how shall I say, uh, uh, um, intrusive. Um, now, at, at, at the ideology at the time, Iranian monarchy was not an ideological system as such, the way the Islamic Republic has become is. Um, but whatever, you know, the, I would just, therefore won't use ideology, but I would use the word dominant uh, discourse or dominant uh, uh, framework. Uh, and that was Iranian nationalism. Uh, with a somewhat perhaps heavy emphasis on pre-Islamic Iran and, and, and reviving ancient Iranian traditions and so forth. Um, and uh, what I call uh, developmentalism. And basically, I think that although it was never said openly, like for example, in Ataturk and uh, Turkey, uh, but that uh, the um, tendency of the government was towards uh, uh, towards uh, uh, secularism. Uh, now, admittedly, uh, um, not all of the population shared this view for reasons that I don't want to get into it, but I think basically it had to do with the uh, process of uh, modernization and the divisions and uh, uh, cleavages and contradictions that this process creates. And it is not just Iran, many other Middle Eastern countries even today face a division between modernity and tradition and, and Islam and other various uh, secular ideologies is common to many other uh, Muslim majority states. But what it is, is that uh, the government, Iran's government and its ideology were challenged essentially from two uh, uh, um, fronts. One was the leftist front. Um, again, I don't want to go into that. The, the left was not a unified front. There were different tendencies within the left, uh, including a so-called Islamic left, uh, which Mujahideen uh, Khal, at least then, uh, sort of represented that trend. Uh, and then it was the religious uh, opposition uh, that uh, Ayatollah Khomeini became its uh, uh, symbol. It, it initially, he didn't start it. It existed, I think, basically since the uh, 1930s when the secularization policies of Reza Shah started. But uh, for a variety of reasons that we can't go into that, uh, Khomeini became the leader of that. 
Um, however, I think that, um, so therefore, we, we, there were opposition grew, and, and finally we had the, uh, the, the uh, crucial year of 1979, where the uh, Islamic forces uh, uh, triumphed. Here, I would like to add, I know some people may not agree with this, I think basically the revolution in Iran was, was made by left. Uh, and uh, whether it was the Islamic left, like Shariati and so on, uh, or others. And as somebody had said, one of the people within the government uh, or close to those things, he said that the left, uh, we, we made the revolution and the uh, clerics uh, made the coup d'etat. Now, you may disagree with that. I'm not going to get into that. So anyway, um, this happened and a, a kind of a rather strange, uh, I would say, creation came into being, uh, which is called the Islamic Republic. Uh, Islamic Republic is a contradiction in terms. Why? Because uh, Republic is essentially a secular construct. In a Republic, it is the people who decide uh, the, not only the nature of the government, but also governmental policy. Whereas in a religious, now it doesn't have to be necessarily Islamic, it could be a Hindu Republic or a Christian Republic. The relig in religion, a source of law and everything is God or the religious scripture. So therefore, anyway, but be that as it may, this Islamic Republic came into being. Now, Islamic Republic uh, has become, uh, had, in, as I say, marks a big break with uh, Iran's, uh, at least modern history, if, uh, if you take it from, you know, even the Qajar time and so on, a uh, big modern history. To begin with, even if, since the Constitutional Revolution, even if in practice, Iran, like many other countries, third world countries, was not, uh, a democracy, certainly, but in the Iranian constitution of 1906 and with the amendments and so on, uh, it was the people, the will of the people, which were uh, the, 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 the basis of legitimacy and the source of uh, ultimately law. Of course, these laws, it was said they should not contravene Islamic uh, uh, principles. Now, with the Islamic Republic, it's very open in its constitution. It all says that sovereignty belongs to God and that God is the legislator. And in fact, Ayatollah Khomeini has a famous saying. He said the parliament's role is not to uh, legislate, but rather it is to set programs, which is a very important thing. So this is, I think, a very important uh, step and also has implications for whether uh, it can be, you know, the gradual change in the Islamic Republic. Um, because, you know, it's very difficult to argue with God, you know, if you say a divine uh, power is that. Whereas, for example, the previous government, the, uh, the monarch system could have been turned into real a constitutional monarchy. I'm not saying that it would have, but I'm just saying that the potential at least was there. The other thing that I think Islamic Republic is different from uh, Iran's previous uh, forms of government, which most of them were monarchy for a long time, uh, is that it has created uh, an institution called the Vilayat Faqih, and uh, which is uh, again contravenes any idea of republicanism. Uh, because uh, especially after in 89 of the Gaza, uh, they made the velayat mutlaqe, absolute. So, in fact, it, it, if you have followed the Iranian, those who have followed the Iranian uh, scene are aware of it, so I'm not saying anything new, uh, that um, uh, many uh, political figures and clerics have often said that uh, disobeying the Vali, uh, Vali which is Ayatollah Khamenei, is actually disobeying God. Now, the uh, Iranian kings, uh, despite all their despotism and so on, they never 
actually said that we are speaking uh, uh, on behalf on behalf of God. Although you know we do know that there are there were theories in Europe and so on of the so-called divine right of uh, uh, kings and so on. So this is another thing. Now the issue of the Vilayat of Fati and uh, you know its antecedents and so on uh, will be discussed in a different session and uh, there will also be another paper so I don't want to go into that. I'm just going to express my own view that I have written in other places. Um, the whole Vilayat of Fati, the way it is, is an absolute innovation uh, in, uh, in Shia Islam. Wherever you go, you don't find this. Uh, there are some ideas where, where initially uh, advanced by in the 18th century and so on, but it, they never really got anywhere. And so the whole question of uh, the Bali uh, Fakhi is is really very uh, uh, is is a bit uh, is an innovation. More importantly, I have to say, and you know, if you go because most of the Shia ideas, including political ideas. It comes from uh, the sixth Imam, Jafar Sadiq. And um, his view of politics in general was that uh, uh, the government and so on are illegitimate. But in these conditions, so the Shia had really to look into the community. But it's also another Shia tenant that you cannot have a just government until the return of the Mahdi. However, the uh, Iranian uh, Islamic Republic claims is that the a just uh, Islamic government, you know, it, it's, uh, this cannot be. I think that in many ways, Shiism is just not conducive to this kind of thing. Although, of course, nowadays they have, you know, new theories and, and so on. So this is basically what I'm saying. The other thing is that, um, a very significant feature of uh, the Islamic Republic, at least there's a lot of them, I'm not going to say everybody is like that, but it is essentially anti-Iranism. Anti-Iranism, per, their purview is not Iran. Uh, prior to that, uh, basically the Iranian governments, whatever they were, their concern was first and foremost with Iran. In other words, how do we secure Iran? How do we uh, you know, improve uh, Iranian people's lives and so on? Very often they didn't do a very good job, obviously for reasons we don't want to get into that. But the fact was that their point of reference was Iran. Melati Iran, the, the uh, nation of Iran. For a long time, I even now, and even now, um, some of the clerics certainly Ayatollah Khomeini was like that, and often Ayatollah Khomeini is like that. They don't use the word Milat Iran. There's always Ummat Islam. That's all fine. But what I'm saying is that the, this is a major departure. I mean, if I might just take a brief thing. In the old days, if we take Nasser's co-centric circles, there was first Iran obviously. And then in the outer thing was Islamic world. And then after that, it was the third world for Iranian policy. But now um, they, at least rhetorically, of course, I'm not saying uh, they are referring to that. The other thing is that frankly, that they actually have campaigned against many aspects of Iran's history and, uh, and, and, and traditions. So uh, again, don't want to go because maybe I'm running already out of time, but this is again a major thing. They have replaced nation with God. So the source of legitimacy is not nation, but it's God. And they have replaced uh, Iran with Islam. And this is also a major, major change uh, in, in, in Iran. Uh, even Iran's conquerors, even Iran's conquerors, eventually identified with that, identified with Iran as a territorial and cultural construct. The concept of Iran Zamin, it was something that uh, uh, was not just territorial, it was also cultural. Okay, so these are some of the major things. And um, in foreign affairs, again, they have, instead of a 
national perspective, an Iran-centered perspective, and they have a kind of universalist perspective, whether it is um, uh, Islamic unity or whether it is uh, uh, anti-imperialist, whatever. Uh, institutionally, there has been many breaks. Of course, the greatest break was with the so uh, institution of <coughs> Belayat uh, Faqi, but uh, many, many uh, um, uh, institutions have been created, the most significant and consequential of which is the Islamic Revolutionary Guards, uh, which really has become a sort of a state within a state. Yeah, and uh, um, we shall see how it, it evolves. Um, it is very difficult, you know, in a country to have two military forces. And, and I think that this is another thing that the, 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 the distance between nation and Iran and the political regime has deepened far more under the Islamic Republic. The, the IRGC is not there to defend Iran except when it's convenient for them. The IRGC is there to defend the system and the so-called gains of the revolution. So this is also something which is very, very... Um, so, uh, so I don't want to enumerate the different uh, organization that has come. Uh, uh, there is all in the paper eventually you will read, inshallah. Uh, but, um, uh, but what has also happened is that for practical purposes, which really mostly for administrative purposes, uh, they had to uh, uh, retain <coughs> certain institutions of the past. So, and they have created some new ones, like for example, the uh, office of the uh, president of the Republic, which really doesn't have much power at all. Um, increasingly, it has lost power. And then, of course, some ministries and, and, and so on and so forth, they, these have been uh, created. When it comes to the cultural uh, issues uh, and this anti-Iran thing, um, I think that uh, they haven't been able to achieve everything, but I think they have achieved enough. They have deepened the cleavage within the country. Uh, I sometimes even cannot understand very well the style of Persian that they are using and writing. Uh, it has become a kind of a illiterate, you know, uh, becoming illiterate as far as it's a Persian is concerned. And, um, and of course, uh, there is a constant campaign in one way or another against, I mean, for example, no rules. They haven't been able to eliminate it, but they certainly do everything they can to discourage people. You know, you know, you should celebrate Eid Qadir or Eid Fet or whatever it is. But of course, this. Professor, happens. I hate to interrupt you, but if you could, but, wrap up, please. Yeah. Okay. No, just if I might, ten seconds, just to. Yeah. So. By basically, I have to say that in just about every area, Islamic Republic has been a major, major break. In fact, I would go as far as to say in Iran's modern history can be divided before and after the Islamic Republic. Of course, um, the, the concept of Iran and the discourse of Iran is useful for them. So they use it instrumentally. When they are in trouble, this is my last word. When there is in trouble, I told Khamenei even said, if you don't want to do this for me or for the Nizam, for the system, do it for Iran. But when it comes for him to do something for Iran, obviously that is not negotiable. So we obey the Iran Kamravel. So that's the <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so very much. That was fantastic. Uh, the, the continuities and the uh, and the ruptures between uh, uh, in uh, before and after the revolution. Thank you so much. We now turn to uh, Aran Keshavarzian, uh, who will uh, talk about protests, uh, participation, and representation in an improvisational polity. Aran, floor is yours. Thank you, Mehran, and thank you for all the conveners who've uh, invited me to participate in this uh, uh, this panel and the, the larger project. And thank you for all the attendees who have uh, logged on in various parts of the world. 
Um, so uh, just like uh, Dr. Hunter, um, I found myself wanting to return to the, uh, the Iranian Revolution of 1979. Uh, but in my case, I was uh, tasked with the, uh, with the challenge of trying to make sense of uh, very current or contemporary events in Iran, um, a, a series of um, multi-day uh, protests, uh, waves of protests uh, that have taken place at the national level, so not just localized level, um, seemingly uh, every few months um, in the last four or five uh, years. Um, I'm specifically re referencing uh, what in, in Persian is referred to as the Day Ma or the December 2017, January 2018 protests, uh, which were initially triggered around the, the rising pr prices of foodstuffs, but fed off of larger grievances around a whole host of social welfare issues uh, that were exacerbated by austerity measures by the Iranian government, as well as international sanctions and so forth. Um, these protests that um, swept many different uh, towns and cities um, uh, ultimately led to over 20 people losing their life, being killed uh, in an attempt to suppress them. Um, uh, but then they were very quickly followed by another wave of protests in November 2019, referred to uh, as the Arban uh, protests in, in Persian. Um, these were triggered more uh, directly at the increase in the price of gasoline. Um, these protests also uh, took place in many different cities, uh, roughly 100 cities. Nearly every single province in Iran experienced uh, one form of one day of a protest in um, November of 2019. Uh, and these were severely, uh, violently suppressed um, estimates range, but at least 300 people uh, lost their lives uh, and possibly uh, the numbers uh, exceed a thousand people. Um, of, um, of course, the government officials try to deflect attention away um, from these protesters by describing them as criminals and placing the blame on Donald Trump and his maximum pressure campaign. Strikingly though, none of the government officials actually really denied that uh, Iranians were struggling under uh, incredibly uh, strained socioeconomic conditions. And that was uh, quite striking. Um, now the standard way that we've talk, we talk about these two protests and the ones that we've been seeing this past few uh, weeks, uh, past few months as uh, this continued waves of these protests, the standard ways that we talk about protests in Iran is to focus on a narrow set of interrelated questions. Will these collective acts of disobedience scale up to topple the regime? Uh, who are the protesters? And what is, the, uh, what is it that is motivating them to take to the streets? What does this portend for the legitimacy, quote unquote, of the Islamic Republic? And it's implicitly, who doesn't participate in the protests and can be thought of as still aligned with the regime or under its control? Now. These questions can be productive in the hands of the right researchers. Uh, however, they have fundamental drawbacks because they encourage us to define the protests and the protesters as necessarily in direct confrontation with the regime, or at least opposed to state institution, institutions. What's more, this framing is overly presentist, assuming that the behavior of citizens and their decision to protest at this particular moment in time is a radical departure from the history of the Islamic Republic. The implication is that protests were a watershed moment when Iranians and, um, from conservative and small towns defect in large numbers from the ruling coalition, while the regime uh, elected to use uh, levels of blood, uh, public bloodletting unseen since the founding uh, in 1979. Formulated differently, the, pro the, the protests and crackdown mark the end of reformism and electoral politics for many, especially those inside Iran. Others infer a quote unquote crisis of legitimacy um, and a political kind of dead end uh, where there's seemingly there's no uh, pathway except for the implosion of the state or uh, utter failure of Iranian citizens to overcome a weakened or vicious, uh, a weakened but vicious regime. Um, now, the essay that I've written for our volume offers a different framework, one that tells a very different story, not one of decline of the, uh, of the state or a break from the past, but, but one of dynamic change emanating from a foundational duality embedded in the post-revolutionary polity. 
By polity, I mean the structured relationship between rulers and the, and the ruled that renders the state and society as interdependent and interpenetrating. These negotiated relationships constitute Iran as a single polity rather than a binary of the people versus the regime or a state detached from its society. Since 1979, Iran's polity has been anchored by mass participation and elite factionalism. These two key features, um, along with the strategies that the rulers have, uh, of the Islamic Republic have used to constrain them, are the immediate ingredients for the improvisational nature of Iran's polity. By adopting this uh, more dialogical approach to contentious politics, what emerges is a conception of protests as extra institutional rather than anti-regime. These unruly protests depart from state regulated and initiated practices of participation, such as elections, and Iran has many of them almost, uh, almost on a yearly basis for one level of government or another, or taking issues to courts or parliamentary lobbying or legal, gather legal gatherings and so forth. People turn to streets that lead to direct clashes with security forces and other symbols of oppression. These rallies are non-normative means of expressing grievances, making demands, and collective bargaining with policymakers. But the power of protests stems from their ability to alter what is acceptable political conduct, defying or extending the legal boundaries that authority, authorities have mapped and have tried to protect. Indeed, the more regularized forms of this content and participation are often a call for state institutions to intervene in the affairs of citizens, to protect them from either exploitative private actors, such as banks, factory owners, smuggling networks, and so forth, or corrupt and ineffectual public servants and agent agencies, local governors, mayors, and so on and so forth. Time and again, um, the protesters um, uh, also can, can, uh, and protests also can, contain demands for the state to recognize independent trade unions and civil associations, and for parliamentary members, journalists, and TV roundtables to take up their concerns, even if indirectly. The challenge, therefore, for us as researchers is not to deci decipher if these protests are subversive enough to bring down the Islamic Republic. They may or may not be. But what we should be thinking about, I argue, is to trace how they are an, 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 how they are an effect of much deeper changes occurring in Iran and reshaping representation and collective bargaining, rather than approach the 2017 or the 2019 or more the summer's protests as reflecting or revealing a crisis the, the, uh, uh, and the true contours of a very opaque state and society. In the paper that I've written for this volume, I insist on recognizing protests as responses to deeper um, aspects of a specific crisis of representation. And I'll just get to that in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a moment. This is a crisis born out of the conundrum of rulers seeking to build control despite central, uh, the central and foundational features of Iran's polity, what I was referring to earlier, participation and factionalism. Now, in the limited amount of time, that we have, I can't go into all of the details that I, I kind of develop in, in the essay, um, but let me just point to them and maybe in the question and, ask, uh, and answer, I, I, if you like, I can return and flesh out some of these points. So I, let's just start with one basic, what I think is a basic and important point. Uh, political regimes are not ideal types. They're not um, uh, simply as democracy or, or dictatorship. Political regimes are shaped by historical trajectories and continuously affected by contestatory domestic social forces and transnational or international circumstances. In the case of Iran, two core attributes stand out in making the polity, stretching back to when it was co constituted in the crucible of social revolution in 1978-79. This is what I said earlier, mass participation, elite fragmentation. For just to give it a slightly comparative perspective, what I want to emphasize is that Islamic Republic was created by social revolution and not by coups and not by foreign invasions. And we have to grapple with that. We have to, in a sense, center this so the aspect of it being a social revolution. So unlike other regimes, 
that emerge out of coups and foreign invasions, post-revolutionary Iranian politics and political culture is imprinted by the real and highly valorized memory of mass popular participation by the magdum, the people. This kind of amorphous category um, uh, uh, that, um, that revolutionaries and political leaders to, to this day cite as um, their kind of uh, legitimating uh, basis. Um, and what's striking about the notion of the Maradome is, is that the category of people took on a particular meaning during the revolutionary juncture because all political currents, despite ideological differences, um, uh, oppose the Pahlavi order uh, because they argued that the, Islam, the Iranian state at that point um, uh, uh, did not distribute national wealth and modernity to all the people in the 1960s and 1970s. So that's, for me, one of the aspects that brought what, what Professor Hunter describes as the left and the religious forces together. That's one point where they, what they agreed upon is the, is the lack of meaningful redistribution of wealth and modernity across all citizens. Um, I can give more details, but for me, the, when I when I mentioned that the, the Iranian political culture has the imprint of, of participation, of, of mass participation, I see it in various aspects. It's in, even in the basic, basic language of inviting people to participate in elections, these various elections for the presidency, for the parliament, for um, and municipal councils, by this uh, calling them to participate uh, uh, incessantly to be present in the public stage. Um, this is strikingly different in the way that uh, elections in, are handled in other authoritarian regimes where uh, dictators are perfectly happy with only 10% turnout. The, for the Islamic Republic, up until recently, the most recent elections, they've actually insisted on trying to get as, as a high percentage as possible. Another way to see uh, the importance of participation is to, to understand how reformists uh, define democracy, and and what and one of the uh, one of the central ways that they frame democracy is the notion of musharakat or participation, right? So the very the, the most important or most prominent reformist organization's uh, name itself is, uh, um, is is participation. Now it's. That, if that's one of the features of the Islamic Republic, the second point I want to point to is that the uh, 1979 revolution was an instance of a mass social movement without mass organization. The, 19, uh, the uprising was composed of an array of parties, underground organizations, clerical networks, and political uh, 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 persuasions. It was highly fragmented, it was highly heterogeneous, it was highly divided. And even when in those opening years, the Islamic Revolutionary Party was organized to try to bring these disparate forces together, we all remember that it, it failed and it, it actually ultimately um, uh, 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 um, was, um, uh, was disbanded. So factionalism, fragmentation is a core feature, and, and Mehran Kamrava, for instance, has written very eloquently about this uh, in his uh, in essays in uh, previous years. I'm going to skip skip over more of this, just partly not to violate the, the time uh, limits. Um, but what I want to point out that is that the Islamic Republic has persisted, as, as was mentioned earlier today, uh, by deflecting and suppressing social political conflicts and struggles. So if mass participation and factionalism generates conflict and struggles, the challenge for the rulers is how do we deflect it and how, how do they deflect it and suppress it? Uh, they, I argue they do this more by improvisation than by design. Re repertoires were devised in, uh, in the opening two decades to corral popular claim making and constrain conflict among the political elite them them themselves. And we can begin to point, or I, I try to point to four ways in, in which this uh, uh, happened in these early uh, in these early two decades, and this will helps us understand the dynamics of Iran's polity, uh, and ways that help us uh, move away from the lens that this these protests are anti-regime and legitimacy is being eroded. Uh, specifically, I point to the, the strategic use of coercion, the use of informal elite bargaining and the use of a kind of a broad administrative machinery of the state um, to limit mass participation uh, and, and break uh, elite uh, um, uh, gridlock. Again, I can come back to this um, uh, in, a, uh, in the question and answer and elaborate on these points. Let me end um, 
with by talking a little bit about the current moment and this notion of crisis of representation. The that what I'm what the paper tries to do is to point to the sharp contradictions of elite fragmentation, mass participation, and repressive power by a minoritarian set of institutions, um, and argue that it holds the seeds to what I'm calling as a crisis of representation, in which Iran's diversity, its heterogeneity, cannot be organized into institutionalized um, uh, channels uh, and to express the entire Iranian political spectrum. With collective, um, um, with collective bargaining by or organizations such as workers, teachers, uh, uh, pensioners, and so forth, severely restricted by law and by intimidation, street protests proliferate by means of, quote, collective bargaining by riot to use a term coined by Eric Hobsbawm. Um, and this uh, collective um, bargaining by riot is a response to the crisis of representation at work in the Islamic Republic. Now, the, the concept of crisis of representation is typically reserved for democracies and political systems with competing political parties. By deploying it here, I do not contend that the Islamic Republic is a democracy. But I am arguing that the Islamic Republic has been functioning with features of an electoral republic. And the revolutionary roots of this polity matter, history matters, not as a constant, but as a catalyst. Only time will tell if uh, Khamenei's strategies uh, in recent years to overrun the core roots of the Iranian polity are a historical parenthesis or a turning point that augurs new patterns of ruler-ruled relations. So obviously in this past presidential election, he's simply happy with having low turnout, low participation, and limiting any sort of uh, elite factionalism and dispute and only having his faction represented in government. If we are to, in the midst of a transformative moment, it will necessarily entail rewriting of the constitutional and electoral rules, the merger of ministries and organizations, and new forms of corporatism and social integration. A realignment of international affairs and methods of, uh, to address economic shortfalls may be necessary. This is what Rouhani imagined he was doing back, into, uh, back when he signed the nuclear de deal of the J JCPOA. With the nuclear deal jettisoned by maximum pressure uh, and Rouhani's uh, brand of pragmatism and centrism being defeated in the halls of power in Tehran, as well as ballot boxes in, in 2020 and 2021, any reformulation of a social contract based on resituating Iran in the global economy will have to be authored by allies of, of Khamenei today, Raisi and so forth in the parliament headed by Ghalibov, and, tactically, uh, and tacitly at least approved by a pulverized and highly skeptical citizenry. None of this is simple and all of it will be controversial. The outcome of what I'm calling a crisis of representation is not foreordained. By their very nature, all crises are opportunities to renegotiate social relations and political institutions. But our opportunities are not always seized. And let me end by saying they oftentimes fester for many, many years. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Arang. I really appreciate it. That was excellent. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Eshrari, now we turn to you. Uh, to discuss the evolution of the Revolutionary Guards in Iran. The floor is yours, Ali Reza. Thank you, Dr. Kamra. Well, hello, everyone. Marhaba bukum jamian. Shukran jazila wa yusharif miyana kuna huna ma'akum. Thank you for having me, and thank you, your colleagues at the Iranian Studies Unit in the Arab Center. So uh, IRGC is the talk of the town and uh, they very much enjoy it. Uh, they present themselves and they like to be known as the jack of all trades, basically Iran's Swiss army knife. Uh, and there may be some tone of proof to that. Uh, in today's Iran, uh, it's very difficult to pinpoint a sphere uh, in which IRGC does not have a direct or indirect role and influence. In parallel with other institutions, as Dr. as Dr. Hunter mentioned, it functions as a military, police, and gendarmerie. It also leads the most powerful branch of Iran's domestic intelligence. 
It is also involved in the decision-making processes and also the implementation of Iran's foreign policy, especially in the Middle East, as we all are aware of. It also functions like a political party. It can mobilize grassroots, uh, it can train young cards of politicians and organize and broker political power. It can organize electoral campaigns, uh, even in Iran's remotest local communities. Uh, as a major economic holding, it is also involved in construction, domestic and foreign trade, banking and finance. RGC also has a, a large media network uh, consisting of uh, film production companies, TV networks, news agencies, print and online press, and plus hundreds of affiliated social media platforms, uh, both in Farsi and Arabic and other languages. Uh, through uh, several cultural and educational organizations, and also with the help of a large uh, network of faith speakers, both clergy, but also laymen and laywomen. Uh, IRGC also produces and mainstream ideological and religious messages. And it also uh, provides various social welfare and humanitarian services. IRGC helps the poor as a charitable organization. It is involved in developing underprivileged areas through what they call jihadi expeditions. and. In the event of uh, natural disasters, such as floods or earthquakes, or like you know the public health crisis, such as COVID-19 pandemic, it also provides rapid response. So uh, this begs the question of how did IRGC uh, became involved in all these aspects of Iranian governance? Uh, let's remember that uh, it had a very humble origin. Back in 1979, it was supposed to be a very small and agile task force only defending the revolution, maximum 10 to 15,000 members. And it was supposed to be uh, temporary. Uh, this is what Khomeini promised at least, that until the period of political transition is completed and the new government is strong enough and the threats of the revolution are gone, then there would be no more need of having an IRGC. So what did this, what happened? Uh, I'm actually going to leave this juicy part to my colleague, Amir Mahdavi, who's uh, going to be in the panel tomorrow and going to keep you hopefully thirsty until tomorrow. But uh, let me just uh, give you a caveat that, and we discussed this uh, uh, in, in, in our essay, uh, that uh, IRGC's growth and prominence uh, was uh, and has been uh, historically contingent. There has not been a grand agenda, uh, no state deliberate uh, plan uh, or you know a project to make RGC what it is and what we saw today. It all had actually happened through a very myriad of challenges and opportunities that rose, of course, domestically, but also in response to uh, regional and international environment at the time. Uh, to give you one example, uh, in the 1980s, during the Iranian Iraq War, uh, we have one IRGC commander named Ahmad Mutawassilian. And he's one of those uh, Iranians who disappeared in Lebanon, or as Iran uh, claims, was kidnapped by Israel. So he was an IRGC commander, and he got into very strong dis dis uh, disputes with uh, other top commanders. Eventually, they forced him out, and they didn't want him to be involved in the theater of war with Iraq. So he just decided to take to took his uh, troops and uh, take it to Lebanon. His rivals at IRGC at the time weren't happy even of this move. They petitioned Khomeini, and they asked him to order him to return. Well, that didn't happen. Obviously, he disappeared, and the rest, as you know, is history. The, hence the very beginning of IRGC and Iran's strategic presence in, in, in Lebanon. Now, uh, in the very remaining time, I'm going to uh, mention uh, rather five characteristics or threats of IRGC uh, that uh, you can see through all these years, these past four decades, and they have remained intact. Uh, in fact, one can argue that they have become uh, perhaps bolder and, and, and more visible. 
these five characteristics or five traits are uh, by no means conclusive, but I think uh, that uh, they can help us all better evaluate and assess RGC's current status in the current uh, circumstances. The first one is uh, perseverance. IRGC is arguably one of the greatest and most successful and perhaps most sustainable experiments of institution building in post-revolutionary Iran. Uh, and uh, this is although the fact that uh, major political camps, right and left, reformists and also principalists, at different times, they have tried to tame it, to confine it, to discipline it. They have even tried to dissolve it. And many other uh, IR agencies and organizations, they have fiercely competed with SEPA over the scope of their responsibility and the extent of their authority. Nonetheless, uh, IRGC has not only preserved, but also has begun uh, 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 stronger. Just to give you some examples, uh, in the very, after the 97 Iran revolution, the two major uh, state-sponsored uh, political parties, the Islamic Republic Party and the Mujahideen organization, so as one of Mujahideen and Malab Islami, they were eventually dissolved due to internal disputes. Same thing happened to major prominent uh, clerical organizations like Jamei Rouhaniyat Mubarez, the Militant Clergy Association, and even the Society of the Seminary of Teachers at home. Uh, it, when you look at other uh, Islamic Republic institutions, for example, Ministry of Intelligence, it was formed in 1983. And when it was formed, it actually uh, rose the envy and awe and anger of the Revolution Guards. Uh, but then you look at it back in the mid 2000s and it see that it has uh, uh, ceded to uh, the competition to IRGC. And today you see that it has been still, you know, remain unsuccessful in gaining its uh, authority. Uh, the same thing happened in uh, major industrial and commercial enterprises in, in Iran. Back in the 1990s, uh, Mustaz Afan Foundation, Bonyad Mustaz Afan, which is actually under the uh, Supreme Leader's purview, uh, was uh, uh, arguably uh, uh, the biggest uh, commercial enterprise in Iran. Not anymore. Sepa's economic center, uh, especially the Khatam HQ, has since then taken over. Uh, another example, uh, it, uh, industrial development and renovation organization, which is under the presidency. It was also arguably the biggest uh, development, economic development organization back in the 1990s. Again, not anymore. And you see that even in the more ideological organizations and institutions in Iran, just to give you one example again here, the Islamic Development Organization, Sazman Tabligat Islami, uh, is uh, an institution which was uh, basically created to produce and promote cultural and media messages according to Islamic ideology. And uh, when you look at today, you see that uh, the, the Islamic Development Organization's human and financial re resources, as well as the volume of production, is not at all comparable to what IRGC produces. Uh, the second is that IRGC has, uh, uh, through the past four decades, has always had a contentious uh, relation with Iran's executive branch, or rather to say civic administration. And this, again, has nothing to do with uh, who from what kind of a political you know, uh, lenience has been in the executive branch. In fact, current Iran Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei back in the 1980s when he was president, he had a lot of trouble with IRGC. They were at that time, for example, trying to uh, push for uh, uh, forming a regular army consisting of both ground, navy and and uh, air forces, and uh, Khamenei was, was fully uh, against it. 
they back channel, they lobbied Khomeini and uh, um, got the permission. In fact, this uh, angered Khomeini so much that he tried to lobby and remove then uh, commander in chief of IRGC, Mohsen Rezai, of course, to no avail. And again, you look at the rest of the history, you see that no matter who was the president, whether it was Hashemi Rafsanjani, Khatami, Ahmadinejad, Rouhani, still, you know, the, there was always this tension between IRGC and uh, these uh, civic administration. One lesson that we can learn is, in fact, even, you know, those people like Hashemi Rafsanjani and Ahmadinejad, who started their uh, term uh, by giving lots of favor and concession to IRGC, eventually that didn't help them to, to uh, cash in and uh, ask uh, uh, IRGC to return the favor. Uh, the third uh, characteristic or the third point that I'd like to mention very briefly here is, is actually about the hegemony of IRGC. And of course, uh, the, the, the first thing that comes to mind is, is, a, is a military organization who has some uh, sort of a, a control over uh, the coercive force. But uh, as we all know it uh, the, from the concept of hegemony from Gramsci, hegemony is not just about coercion. It's also about uh, basically securing uh, and co-opting uh, uh, and making the, uh, the, the Iran civil society, political elites, cultural elites to get used to its presence. And you see that has happened in, in the past uh, four decades. In fact, a lot of uh, secular cultural and secular business elites, private sector in Iran, are signaling consent to be co-opted by RGC. They are doing business with RGC. Uh, private sector, uh, they, they, uh, for their companies, they sometimes hire RGC as board members or as executive directors. They have no way uh, the, other than conducting business with different IRGC branches like uh, Khatam HQ, either as a subcontractor or either directly, you know, I mean, doing commerce and finance with them. The same has happened even with the cultural elite. So you, you look at uh, the scenery back in 1990s and 2000, still it was a taboo for uh, Iranian intellectuals, cultural elite to be directly associated and publicly associated with IRGC, not anymore. You see, for example, Masoud Kimiai, a very prominent Iranian uh, filmmaker, uh, whose uh, many films that he made be, uh, before the revolution are still, you know, considered cult in, in, in current Iran. And he has made a number of movies with the support of RGC and with their funds. Look, you look at uh, uh, the, the very uh, famous uh, Iranian superstar, Niki Karimi. She is an actress, but also a feminist uh, 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 filmmaker. Uh, which, in fact, actually, her movies have been banned by the Iranian regime, yet she is fine uh, play, uh, acting in one of the very famous uh, series of all the time in the post-revolution Iran of Azadeh, which was made actually in 2020. So uh, that gives us a very different understanding of what we basically hear uh, in the media, that there is a detachment or a very distinct separate Yes, between IRGC and the society. And when you look into it, in fact, it's, it's very different. However, and this is my fourth one, uh, there is some sort of a, a no strings attached policy here. So that doesn't mean that if you're conducting business with IRGC, you're also going to be enjoying political favor from them. No. They're, they're fine doing business with you, uh, but when it comes to political opposition or when it doesn't serve their purpose, they're also very happy to suppress you or to put you on trial or, you know, just arrest you. And this is not just about the, of course, Iranian uh, uh, private sector and the civil society or intellectuals, but also the political parties. And it's both ways. So you look at also a lot of uh, reformists, which are politically opposing the uh, IRGC, but when it gets to business, they're conducting business with IRGC and they don't have any problem with that. For example, just give you one example, uh, the brother of uh, former uh, vice president, Eshaq Jahangiri, he was arrested for one branch of IRGC a couple of years ago, 
just a year ago, he signed a, a, a hundred million dollar contract with another branch of IRGC. Uh, it's 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 not very uh, you know black and white and simple that because they're politically opposing so they're also out of doing business with IRGC. And the very last point that I'd like to mention is in fact the internal conflicts within IRGC. So again, uh, IRGC is usually depicted in both media and academia as a homogeneous entity. Uh, in fact, it's never been. Since birth, since inception, it has remained an organization full of internal disputes, rivalry, and it has witnessed a couple rounds of either sudden or gradual purges. I gave you one example over uh, Motovasse Leon. Uh, the same thing happened with the leftists back in the 80s with the uh, followers of, and supporters of Ayatollah Montazeri in early 90s. Uh, and uh, we see the same dynamism even today. In fact, if uh, these internal conflicts and disputes have not been very visible to the public eye, or let's say to the naked eye, what we saw back in the 2021 presidential election, the very recent election, uh, was that it became way more visible. Uh, it was uh, uh, broadly reported in by various media that different RGC commanders, for example, they backstabbed each other, they went after each other, they washed their clothes in public. And just very today, when I was just reading the news, for example, the former head of Khatam HQ, which is uh, the largest general contractor in Iran, uh, Saeed Mohammad, criticized Ali Bah, the very, you know, I mean, uh, the, uh, not the first, but the second, actually, uh, also head of uh, Khatam HQ and the current Majlis speaker, as he is the, the, the cause of pro political problems in Iran. And he's the person who's not, uh, you know, uh, uh, actually letting him to serve in the current, you know, uh, uh, executive government. Uh, so what does this say? Uh, I'm going to end with this, that interestingly, you look at other uh, Iran's republic institution, and you always see a, a personality trait also attached to that. When you talk about the presidency, you always talk of different people who were in charge of those institutions. The same is even with the supreme leader. We talk of Khomeini and we talk of Khamenei. But interestingly, although there has been always this rivalry, internal rivalry and conflict within IRGC, IRGC has successfully been able to always keep a public brand intact, which is always collective. I myself right now and other people, when we talk of RGC, we, we talk of them just as RGC. RGC did that, RGC there. We don't say, oh, the commander of RGC decided to do that. Or we don't talk of why, you know, these commanders' policies are different. This has been also another interesting aspect that amid all these, you know, troubles, purges, internal conflicts, they have been able to maintain this cohesion. Whether they're going to be able to do that uh, in light of the, the, the very recent, um, uh, more visible internal, you know, dynamism and conflict, that's a question that, that, uh, that is very interesting and we should watch to see what's going to evolve in the future. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ali Reza. My sincere thanks to all three presenters, uh, Professors Shirin Hunter, Aran Keshavarzian, and Ali Reza Ishravi. We have some time for questions and answers. Our uh, presenters have kindly agreed to, um, uh, to take some questions. We have a number of questions from social media already. Uh, and uh, if, you, if I could ask, that uh, you can you can submit your questions online either through Zoom directly or through other social media platforms. Those questions will come to me, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. I ask our question our audiences if you have questions to please keep them concise and brief, so we can get to all three of them. And also, I ask our presenters to keep the their responses. Uh, brief so we can uh, get to uh, uh, as many of them as possible. We already have some uh, questions uh, that have come and I will ask, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Professor Hunter, did you want to say something? Uh, you're, you're muted. Uh, sorry, you're, you're muted.
Um, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, go uh, ahead, please. Well, whenever you think best, I'd like just to respond to a couple of comments and made and perhaps clarify some of the points and uh, Sure. Uh, Whenever maybe you... in the context of answers to questions, because we already oh, we have no problem. That's questions, fine. and that that would be, uh, that's that's fine. be that's terrific. Fine. Well, one of the questions asks, and I uh, and either three of you prob probably, um, uh, Shirin, you can uh, start, and if others want to chime in, and the question is, does the uniqueness of the Islamic Republic as a model of government account for its resilience? Uh, I, I suppose the question is, why is the state so resilient and does its uniqueness have anything to do with it as a governing model? Um, Professor Hunter? Well, I mean, uh, I, I really uh, have to say that 40 years is not uh, a kind of a enough, uh, uh, you know, enough uh, time uh, lapse to, to, to justify whether the Islamic Republic is resilient or not. Uh, that this is a very big uh, question. Uh, well, there are, there are a lot of, uh, I think that uh, reasons for it. Uh, and uh, part of it is that, uh, uh, you know, they have made a very uh, uh, efficient use in some ways of using the religious discourse and so on. Uh, and I think that the outward behavior of the some of the leaders of Islamic Republic has been, if I might use this word, folksy, you know, that we are part of you, we are just like you. The fact that they sit, they don't sit on chairs and they just, you know, they think that, which is, I, I, well, anyway, I don't want to get to that, but those kind of things, I think that might have had some appeal to that. But also that you have to say that a lot of those Iranians that who might have disagreed with that, um, to be honestly, even after massive invasions, perhaps I don't want to bring the, that subject up, there has never been such an amazing migration of Iranians from the country. I mean, millions and millions have gone. And um, the Shah's regime, of course, was not great. Nobody can say that. I mean, if it w was, it would be still there, you know? So that's not, and I don't think that every time one says something about this current regime and it's uh, that people say, oh, well, Pahlavi were worse and they were, de we are not, Pahlavi is dead and gone for 40 years. We are not talking about these people. So this is one of the things. It's so Thank you. Well, but Mehran, I need to answer a couple of the things they had said. If you don't want me, I will just keep quiet. No problem. But no, uh, we, we have a lot of questions we need to get to. So if I could uh, just uh, answer some of the questions, and if there's time, then we'll come to the points okay. that no are probably in the context of no questions. There's a question uh, that has come, uh, Arang, it's directed at your presentation in terms of the nature of the protest. And the question, uh, to, which to some extent you address, asks uh, how are these uh, protests contained? But also related to that is this whole notion, can these questions, uh, uh, can these protests as they did, for example, in 2009, get out of hand and evolve into social movements that would then mushroom into another revolution of the kind we saw in 1978-79? Um, so, so, I mean, I, I tried to consciously try to avoid in that kind of predictive game, right, uh, by uh, not uh, trying to force ourselves to th think of any protest that occurs in Iran, whether it's a labor protest or a protest against lack of water or um, clean air or what have you, as being necessarily the start of a, another revolution. I think that, 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 that forces us to misanalyze uh, what we're seeing. Um, the, re the reason that they, I, I, if to go to the first part, I mean, I, the reason that they haven't been able to, in a sense, aggregate, uh, I see as two things. One, you can't deny that um, secure, uh, securitiz securitizing politics in Iran, um, violence, intimidation is in effect. It, it, it works, unfortunately. Um, and especially it has been effective in preventing national level uh, 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 or, or broad uh, national level um, uh, coordination and activities. That's what was kind of striking about 2017 
and 2019. And I would point my finger to the current um, uh, oil worker strikes that are being led by contract workers that also have a national, it's not just Khuzestan, it's the entire country. So th these are significant uh, examples of Iranian Iranians uh, coordinating, organizing, coordinating, disseminating um, uh, strategies. But the other way that my, part of my answer is what I was trying to argue is that these protests, um, yes, I know there are chants of against Khamenei and against reformists and conservatives, and they have this, this, this kind of this dimension to them. But in most of these cases, when you look at it, they're actually demands on the state to intervene, intervene against a private factory owner owner who's not paying salaries, intervene on a governor who's not providing clean water. Um, so from my reading, and it's deeply problematic because I'm, because I'm sitting in the United States of America reading newspapers and following um, uh, events from afar, but from my reading is that there, there is a characteristic to these, um, these protests that we've seen over the last, and it's the last 10, 15 years, it's not just the last two, three years, that time and again are calling for what I'm calling for representation calling for the government to recognize a union or an association. Um, so I, I would, you know, I would argue that we should approach our, our, our reading, our interpretation of what's happening um, from that standard, from that vantage point. And that send us, that, that, so then the question of will they become a revolution, I don't think is actually a, 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 a very fruitful way to um, uh, uh, analyze. Thank you. Um, Ali Rizal, there's a question about the uh, nature of the IRGC and in particular its relationship with the regular army. Uh, are these parallel institutions? And then uh, related to that is this whole uh, notion that you mentioned of the tension between the president and the IRGC, including when Khamenei was the president. But we know that the relationship between Khamenei and IRGC, Khamenei as the Velayat e uh, is, is, at least from a distance, it seems solid. It seems that, uh, that uh, there is a symbiotic almost relationship between Velayat e and the IRGC. And what accounts for that relationship and the depth uh, of that relationship, if it does exist? So as uh, to the question about uh, RGC and Iran's regular or army or Artesh, uh, yes, there are, uh, uh, one can say, I guess, fairly that these are parallel institutions. However, I have to say that at least, you know, from 1990s, there is a very clear and distinct division of labor and responsibilities of how each of these, of course, military organizations would conduct affairs and are, you know, in charge of what kind of, you know, I mean, basically military protection in the country. And about the second one, uh, yes, one can in fact argue, and we have also mentioned this in our uh, essay, that uh, IRGC has had a rather exclusively loyal relationship to the office of supreme leader. But however, when you look at the two different supreme leaders, uh, Khomeini and of course Khomeini, there is a difference in the way that relationship was. Uh, during 1980s, Khomeini era, uh, IRGC was loyal to uh, the supreme leader. However, it was one of uh, uh, the players, political players, who had to also you know, come to the supreme leader's office and uh, ask for you know, a meddling, negotiation, supporting to gain more favors or concession. Uh, since Ayatollah Khamenei's office, uh, that has changed and it has uh, rather, uh, IRGC has become the favorite institution or the favorite child of the supreme leader. And uh, part of what happened in IRGC, you see that it started from Khamenei, of course, when he took office, uh, all those people who were against him, they either, you know, left IRGC back in the late 1980s, even before he took power, or then through a very gradual plan, 
they were purged or they were forced to retire from IRGC. That again started to happen with the supporters of Ayatollah Montaziri, who was supposed to be actually the supreme leader instead of Khamenei. And then you see reformists you know, forcing out. In fact, Mohsen Rezaei was kind of forced out in, in 1997. Uh, to resign. He didn't want to resign, and uh, but he was forced out by the supporters and loyalists to Khamenei, and he eventually, you know, I mean, did that. Uh, and that dynamism has existed since then. So I hope uh, that I was able to answer that question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Shane, your next question has to deal with the experimental nature of some of the institutions that came about as, uh, as a result of the revolution. Um, the question says, uh, are, these, uh, uh, are these institutions that have come about? You mentioned the, the innovative nature of the Velat Fahih institution. Are these kind of experiments that have now been institutionalized? Uh, can you say a little bit about uh, this the, kind of the historical break and the experimental nature of these institutions? Well, I, I think that uh, when it comes to the question of the Velayat uh, Fari, and uh, basically, you know, you can say that a clerical takeover of political power in Iran, I think I will say that, you know, um, Iranian reformists are basically the left wing that remain and try to work within the system. When the USSR fell, they suddenly were sort of orphaned and so they became liberal. So I have a much more, I don't approach the Iran issues in a, through some kind of a theoretical model. I just see what's happening and then you draw your conclusions. So I think that what has happened, I think if anybody who has read Ayatollah Khomeini, I think Ayatollah Khomeini always wanted political power, but the circumstances were not uh, 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 sort of, uh, uh, conducive to that. Uh, when you read his uh, books and his statements in particular, uh, you know, he had the idea that the clergy really uh, should have the real political power in Iran. And um, initially he wouldn't say this openly, and also he didn't, uh, you know, think that initially, didn't think that the clergy, because Iran at the time was not ready uh, to for this, uh, that the clergy should actually be directly involved uh, in politics. I think that a number of things changed Khomeini's uh, um, mind and then also uh, uh, Khamenei and others that came after him. And one of that was that uh, uh, Khomeini became disenchanted with the kind of those secular, whether it was the uh, JP Meli National Front people or whether it was some leftist or whatever, uh, became very disenchanted with them. He felt betrayed, you know, I mean, with Bani Saad, Otsade, and the Ilk, Bazargan and whatever. And so what happened, he came to conclusion that the only people that can be trusted are actually the the clergy. So I think if you really look into the progression of the Islamic Republic from the uh, 1979 onward, you have seen that a creeping clericization uh, of the entire system. And so, and of course, with Ayatollah Raisi, now everything has become uh, combined. Of course, uh, Rafsanjani was a cleric, of course, uh, uh, the, um, you know, uh, Rouhani was a cleric. But the one thing that is much more important, it's very difficult, as my colleagues have also noted, uh, Iran is a complex uh, situation and it can be approached through a variety of prisms, through a variety of analytical tools, and each of us have our own little approach, which doesn't, you know, invalidate other approaches, but I'm just saying that it's very complex. So I think the clerical rule has become really very, very uh, established in Iran. This is a very interesting thing during, I am the oldest, I suppose, member of the panel. And so I actually grew up in Iran of those years, you know. So I know firsthand certain things, it's not just book learning. 
And so what I'm trying to say is that we never, you know, had um, so-called Imam Jum'a, Friday Imam, uh, to be in every inauguration for every government thing. Rahbar has a representative everywhere in every uh, province and so on, in addition to the governor and so on, you have a representative of Rahbar, which frankly has a real power. I don't think governor can do anything without the representative of Rafa. So I think this has been a gradual creeping in. And I submit that this has a lot to do with Khamenei's own personality and his really basically um, dictatorial kind of uh, tendency. Of course, uh, the uh, tradition of dictatorship in Iran goes way back. I'm not trying to blame the regime for that. Uh, but what I mean is that this has become Another thing that I have to say is that increasingly Iran really has turned into a, what I call a kleptocracy. It's a kleptocracy and everybody is making money. Ideology and so on are kind of you know, covers for essentially what it is, competition for power and money. And uh, in an economic situation that is not very good, obviously if you, know, you are an actress, you have to live. So if IRGC says, come and make a film for me, you make it. Or, you know, we all have to eat, right? So <laughs> that is it. But if I might, and I please indulge me, and I promise I will quite. I would like to say a couple of things about uh, the kind of economic conditions. During... Very, very quickly, if you very, will, very because quickly. there are some questions. I think one thing that generally, I have written this, but one thing that generally, I think a lot of analysts, and of course, most of the analysts, both in Iran and in um, America in particular, but also in Europe was done by the leftists. I mean, people like Fred Holliday, you know, and the, who told that Republic of Yemen was the best thing under the sun. And, and I don't want to get, I knew him personally. So anyway, the point I'm saying is that there was a lot of distribution. There was a lot of, uh, uh, but you don't understand where Iran started out. When was the situation under the Qajar and, and then what else happened? There was nothing, absolutely nothing. So what we had in Iran was that what I call, and the developmental people call it, the revolution of rising expectations. Everybody, to some extent, had improved, but other some people had improved more. And then, of course, they had. Uh, and then, of course, I would say that one major reason was that Shah was too distant and too remote. He had not the popular touch. He couldn't really uh, make people basically like him, and so. And then, of course, there were some people, as Taj Zadeh has said. He said we were all. Um, subdued by the dominant discourse, which was Marxism, Leninism, and so on. And so, and so I, in fact, if you really look beyond all these niceties of Islamic Republic, uh, the uh, Islamic Republic is a very much of a Soviet style government and a lot of things that they do. And, uh, and that is what I'm trying to say that it was- there's, a, there, uh, there's actually a question, I hate to interrupt you, right? No, no, no. Please, that's okay. I understand. No, no, no problem. No. If I could just interject here and ask a question from the, all of the panelists. Of sure. A question that asks on this point that Shirin just raised, is Iran going the way of the China model in the sense that there is developmentalism on the one hand, or at least the rhetoric of developmentalism, there is the Islamic Republic as an ideological, um, as an ideological umbrella, uh, but Iran is as Islamic as today China is communist. Um, there are parallels that can be made. Is that a valid comparison? And is can anyone uh, would anyone care to comment on that? May I? <laughs> Sure, sure, please. I don't want to say, no, I think that um, one of the things people don't understand is that uh, one of the Achilles heel of the Islamic Republic is its foreign policy. And this foreign policy really has become stymied uh, by this, the fact that uh, um, the regime, or at least Khamenei, has made anti-Americanism 
and so-called anti-imperialist struggle, which itself is a, a Marxist-Leninist construct. There's nothing in, you know, um, and opposition to the kind of, uh, you know, Israel and the whole Palestinian issue as a foundation of the regime legitimacy. And that everything is just revolves around it and everything else is stillborn. Why would have Iran had sanctions imposed on it? We criticize Trump rightly for all these things that they, you know, impose sanctions on Iran, they did this. But how did this happen? It happened when first the Iranians with the hostage crisis forced the United States to break. And then they went and started chanting death to America, death to America. So do you know what I mean? And even now, when you look what, for example, uh, Zarif said in that file that said, in talking about uh, the um, battlefield and diplomacy, battlefield is Khamenei and the IRGC, their, their power, and their wealth is dependent on this thing. Whereas China in foreign policy basically has a nationalist outlook. You know, uh, it is, uh, even from the Deng Xiaoping and others, they may have domestically, internally, I mean, in internally too, they don't have a communist party for, for okay. that purpose. But the, what right. I mean is that the problem of Islamic Republic, I come back to it, is that it doesn't have an Iran focused approach. Right. And, and they have some ideological uh, hang ups that prevents them evolving into anything, whether China model or India model or whatever you name it. Thanks. There's a, thank you. On that point, there's a question about the IRGC, uh, Ali Reza. And it says Can you comment on whether we're witnessing? a rising anti-clericalism in Iran, both within Iranian society, as well as within factions in the ruling system. Uh, can we, for example, imagine the IRGC as evolving into an anti-clerical institution? Yeah, that's hard to imagine, frankly speaking, right now. But yes, there are certain uh, traits, trajectories that one can see within RGC and also within Iranian society. In fact, if you look at uh, the number of politicians in, in Majlis, uh, Iranian parliament, you see a, a very uh, visible decrease in the number of clergy from the the first, second, the third malice, and now you look at the current malice, which was the election was back in 2020, and you see a number of, uh, of, of, of almost half of those actually are working on, on a study of uh, uh, the, the, the parliament members who were selected in 2020, and half of them were always uh, uh, supported or backed by RGC and their laymen. They are not. They are not clergy. And in fact, a lot of clergy, especially in local areas, they are on the payroll of IRGC. And again, IRGC supports a number of faith speakers that are not clergy, but are quite very popular. If you look at their social media accounts, they have a million or two million even followers. Uh, there are people following them, talking about them, and uh, that has uh, raised uh, the ire and anger of. Uh, clerics in, at, at all, a number of them have gone publicly criticizing RGC, even meddling thereafter. So again, it's a very interesting dynamism to watch over, but I'm sorry, I'm very uh, conservative to predict how this is going to be evolved in the future. Perfect. Thank you. Arun, you get the last word. Oh, uh, okay. I didn't mean to take the last word, but I, I just wanted to... Uh, 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 I wanted to second what Ali Rizal just outlined and just remind everyone that you know, there's a, there has always been a very strong anti-clerical streak in Iranian um, uh, society, culture, in even uh, Iranian, uh, Iranian uh, traditions of Islam. Um, um, so it, that has been alive and well, and Ali Reza points out that it even exists within the framework of the IRDC, even though it may be difficult. Um, to imagine uh, it developing, but uh, we obviously have Ahmadinejad as another kind of version of that, if you will. Uh, I did want to maybe go to the question of um, the China model because it does get raised uh, not only outside of Iran but Iranian politicians for, I think it's two decades, three decades have evoked the China model as an ideal pathway. Um, 
Um, I, I think part of the confusion is, is it's never quite clear to me what that means. What is the China model? Is it is it just economic growth and dictatorship? Well, I mean, well, and that, that's maybe not, that's too broad to think of it as a model. One way to think about the China model that for me it doesn't fit Iran is the China model, as, as Professor Hunter just pointed out, it has a, a, as, a, a, um, as a single party, the, the Chinese Communist Party. And that was kind of my point earlier on was that uh, the Islamic Republic has never had such a strong unifying um, political apparatus. May, and, and what Ali Reza uh, is pointing out is maybe the IRGC is, is, is the one unique entity that, is, uh, that is, plays that kind of that, that role. So uh, Iran doesn't have the, uh, commun uh, a communist party. But the other dimension of the China model that sometimes people discuss is a kind of a highly centralized um, uh, dimension, but allowing for local provincial uh, municipalities to experiment and, and kind of there's a bottom up dimension. Which I, which I think um, may have been in the minds of people around uh, Khatami during his uh, his tenure in office, but what I from afar, what I what I what I the sense I get is that that space for local officials, for municipalities, for even governors to experiment is has shrunk in recent years for a number of reasons, in, including the sanctions and so on and so forth, but but also because of Khamenei's own uh, um, intolerance for allowing any uh, kind of autonomous percolation of, of social forces. So um, it, it, I think all, all po polities are, are unique in their own way. Um, so we have to actually grapple with what Iran is rather than what it may aspire. It may aspire to be followed the China path or the Malaysian path or the Korean path or, or, or what have you, but it, it doesn't necessarily have the, the social political ingredients uh, to pull pull that off. Perfect. Thank you so very much. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I want to thank our distinguished panelists for uh, an incredibly fruitful uh, discussion and set of presentations. I also thank our audiences worldwide. Uh, please join us again tomorrow, same time, for more discussion on different political institutions in the Islamic Republic. Thank you very much, and uh, have a good day from Doha. Thank you, Mehran. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Very much. Good night.